From our 22 News Broadcast Center, this is 22 News in Focus. Good afternoon and welcome to 22 News in Focus. I'm Nick Oresco. The COVID-19 pandemic brought many social issues to the public's view, including the importance of women in the workplace. Many women stayed home to take care of children and supervise their ongoing schooling. Some living in domestic abuse situations fell trapped with nowhere to turn. On today's program, we'll be talking with officials from two local organizations that provide programs and services for women and girls, from education to self-sufficiency to health and wellness opportunities. Thousands of women and girls have support through the YWCA of Western Massachusetts and Girls Inc. of the Valley. Today, we'll find out about, find out about what they do and how you can help with their mission. Joining me first today is Elizabeth Deneen, CEO for the YWCA of Western Massachusetts. Thank you for being on the program with us today. Thank you for having me. All right, so the YWCA was founded over 150 years ago, 156 to be exact. They provide many services to women and families across our region, Western Massachusetts and beyond. If you can start off by uh, explaining to me what that mission is. Sure. The mission of the YWCA is very simple. It's eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting social justice. About how many women and families utilize your services every year, ballpark roughly? Over 11,000. And how significant is that? That seems like a very large number. It, it's a large number because of there's so many women and children in Western Mass who are in need of the services that the YWCA provides. There are a lot of programs that you do provide. What are some of those programs? Sure, we have four residential programs and 20 community-based programs. The four residential programs that we have are our domestic violence shelter, our supportive housing apartments, and we have two teen residential programs, one in Springfield and one in Holyoke. And then we have 20 community-based programs that primarily, one way or another, are focused on providing supports for survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, or stalking. Out of those programs, which ones are most in demand? Uh, the one that's probably in most demand is our domestic violence shelter. Uh, women call our hotline 24-7, uh, 365 days a year trying to get admitted into the shelter because they're either in imminent danger or the threat of death. What are some of the most pressing concerns of women coming to you for assistance? Uh, some of the most pressing concerns are safety for them, women seeking safety for themselves and for their children. And they're also looking for resources to deal with past trauma. So they're looking to receive counseling for sexual assault or domestic violence. Obviously, we uh, put past the COVID-19 pandemic, but Massachusetts is currently facing a housing crisis for women trying to leave a domestic violence situation. Finding a safe place can be very difficult, especially if they leave on short notice and with children. What domestic violence shelter services do you offer? So uh, it, we have a domestic violence shelter on our campus at the YWCA on Clow Street in Springfield. It is, um, it houses 19 families, um, and the families could be a mom with one child or a mom with up to four children. Um, and basically what we do is, if a woman is in imminent danger or threat of death, she can call our hotline and then our hotline we'll check the availability of rooms in the shelter. And if there's a room in the shelter, they can move in. We try to provide as many wraparound services as possible to the women that enter the shelter so that they can get the resources that they need to leave uh, and go to the next location 
that is safe for themselves as well as their children. You mentioned that hotline. How often is that hotline used? <laughs> it's used all day long. All day long, like I said, 24-7, 365 days a year. Uh, people are calling the hotline. But they're not just calling the hotline to get access to a shelter bed. They're calling the hotline to find out about all of the other programs that the YWCA offers. So the women that work at our, on our hotline know all of the programs that the YWCA offers. So when somebody calls, they're trying to connect them with as many programs that we have for, you know, so that we can offer those services. And if we don't have that particular service, then we'll try to connect them with somebody, some other nonprofit in the agency or, uh, excuse me, in the area or in New England. We have that hotline information right now on your screen. The hotline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How important is it to have that hotline accessible all the time? It, it's so important because sometimes it takes a woman many thoughts or, or attempts to call before they actually call. So we train our hotline staff to be incredibly receptive and supportive when somebody calls. And we actually time the calls no more than 10 minutes so that we can keep, uh, keep it moving because we get so many calls on the hotline. But it's uh, the women that work on the hotline have all sorts of uh, training on our programs. They also have all sorts of training on trauma. So they try to be as supportive and resourceful as possible when somebody calls. High in demand for that hotline. You mentioned that training. What kind of training goes into um, being able to answer these questions? Obviously, you mentioned it. it is very difficult for someone to even pick up the phone and uh, dial that number, but what kind of training goes into that kind of process? That's a great question. Anybody who works at the YWCA has to take a 40-hour training, and we offer it like four times a year, but it's 40 hours of training that exposes the new employee to what is sexual assault, what is human trafficking, what is stalking, what, what is domestic violence, um, how do you treat a child when you're dealing with children? How do you treat a man that might be seeking services? How do you support a woman coming here? So there's, we want to make sure that we're not inflicting any additional trauma or pain on somebody who has enough courage to either call the hotline or walk through the front doors of the YWCA seeking services. So we have trainings that go on throughout the year. Um, you have your 40 hour training, but then every couple of weeks we have uh, lunch and learn. So that is a really big um, component of being a YWCA employee. And additionally, we're always looking for other sources of training within the Pioneer Valley, as well as the state that we can send our people to. I want to talk about the supportive housing program. What is it and who is eligible for it? So we have uh, two big buildings on our campus on Clow Street in Springfield. The second building is where we house our supportive housing units. And we have 20 apartments there. The apartments have a kitchen, a dining room, bedrooms and bathrooms and to be eligible to have one of those apartments, you have to be a survivor of domestic violence, stalking, or sexual assault, or human trafficking. Um, our funding comes from the Department of Justice, Office of Violence Against Women. So we, we get funding to provide additional services to the women that are within um, our supportive housing programs such as economic empowerment programs and things like that. But the women stay in those apartments usually 18 months and then they move on to find 
uh, permanent housing after they've, they've lived there. You also have the coordinated entry program. How is that different from the supportive housing program? What does that entail and who is eligible for that? So the coordinated entry program that the YWCA runs has um, a funding that comes from HUD, from the federal government. And that particular program helps survivors find housing. So when somebody participates in the coordinated entry program, they know that they're not going to be able to get housing in our domestic violence shelter, and they're not going to be able to obtain housing from our transitional supportive housing program because they're filled. So we're trying to work with survivors to find them a safe place to live. So we have uh, housing navigators, uh, a team of four people who work with those women to provide sometimes short-term housing and then ultimately long-term housing for them. And then in order for cr to create conditions of success for them, we offer a plethora of other services uh, while they're the first year that they're in their housing. So that we're trying to create an opportunity for them to succeed and, and to, to become independent. Right, it's all step-by-step -step basis. Yes. Any fees, costs for this? No. Um, if you are a resident of our domestic violence shelter, there are no costs. We provide uh, the housing, we provide breakfast, lunch, and dinner f five days a week. On the weekends, they provide their own food. Uh, we provide um, everything that you can think of, like toiletries, clothes, um, anything that somebody would need uh, to feel comfortable uh, in their living area because the women don't come to the YWCA to live in the shelter with uh, lots of things. What they would probably bring if they bring anything at all is some type of toy or comfort uh, blanket for their child because they're fleeing a situation where they don't feel safe. Uh, if our supportive housing, they pay a minimal amount of fee, um, but what we're trying to help them do is to create cr good credit so that when they want to leave in a year or 18 months, they've established a record of success. So the landlord that is going to take them in to house them knows that they can pay rent, that they can budget their money, that they're going to be a good tenant. And then anybody who participates in our coordinated entry programs, um, we provide the services for them and we'll provide the first um, and last payment for their rent and their down payment. And if they have uh, like items that they want to move into the house with them, we will help uh, get a moving company to, you know, we'll pay for that. Any way to help them get them back on their feet, yes. for sure. Yes, Well, the YWCA provides more than just housing. We'll discuss the other programs available when we come back. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. My guest is Elizabeth Deneen, CEO for the YWCA of Western Massachusetts. We're discussing the services and programs available for women and families offered by the organization. We touched on the issue of emergency shelter for someone needing to get out of a domestic violence situation for women who call the YWCA for help. You offer other programs as well. Let's bring Elizabeth back in now with us. What does the community-based domestic violence services program provide? We provide individual counseling and group counseling for any woman who is a survivor of domestic violence. And it's not just women, it's also children too, unfortunately. Luckily, you guys are there to help with that process. process. Explain the Children Who Witness Violence program, what services are included for children and how is it beneficial? 
The Children Who Witness Violence program is for children the ages, between the ages of three and 17. And it's for any child who has witnessed domestic violence, experienced either physical or sexual violence, or witnessed any type of violence within the neighborhood, such as a shooting. So th those kids come to the YWCA um, and they receive 12 to 15 sessions of counseling from a social worker. And they, uh, we have four different rooms at the YWCA that are particularly geared for, for this kind of counseling. So uh, for the younger kids, they're very bright, they're, they're um, very positive, um, there's all sorts of toys and games and books. And then for the kids that are older, the teens, we have um, rooms that are designed to make them feel comfortable and like a young adult. Um, and so what, what the counselors are doing is, is trying to change the paradigm. So if the kids participate in the counseling, the hope is that they'll develop the skills and tools so that they don't have to repeat any of the violence that they witnessed or that was perpetrated upon them. And it's one of those programs that it's, it's really fascinating to watch the kids come to the YWCA to see their, their therapists. Th they usually are bouncing up the <laughs> stairs, they're happy. Uh, because I think intuitively they realize that this is a program that's going to help them. And I'll give you an example. There was a young boy who was 13 years old who came from Palmer and his grandmother used to drive him back and forth to the counseling sessions. And I started every week I'd see him and we'd say hello. And toward the end of his counseling, uh, I think it was week 14, I said to him, how do you feel? Has this helped you? And he said to me, Liz, I feel. And I said, what do you mean you feel? And he said, I feel everything. He said, I used to like to play football so that I can go on the football field and pound everybody and knock people down. Now I like to play football because I like the strategy of the game and I want to win. And when I go to school, I'm not sitting alone anymore because I'm not angry. Now I know how to talk to other kids and listen to kids instead of getting mad at kids and wanting to hit them. And so, you know, this is a 13-year-old kid who's a boy. So I, I, I was so excited for him that in such a short period of time that he learned so many good coping skills. And it gives you hope that as he travels through his life, he won't repeat the violence that he experienced. You have kids of all ages in this program. Do the older kids get a chance to talk to the younger kids, you know, get the mentors out of the way, the people who are trained, but do the younger, the older kids get to talk to the younger kids to talk about, you know, what they went through and maybe to help them deal with what they are going through? We haven't done that yet because, um, we're spending, we, we're, because our funding is so specific of 12 to 15 sessions, we focus primarily on the individual before us. But what we have done with the teens is form some groups because we have found that if some of the kids that are 12 and up know that somebody else has experienced the same thing, they're more inclined to be more forthcoming about what they've experienced. And then they start to uh, offer support to each other. And so as a result of that, we've gone into the area sc schools because sometimes the school adjustment counselor is referring someone to us. And then we've had groups within the schools. You have something called a safe plan. How does that work and who is eligible for that? So the safe plan um, advocates, we have five of them that go into the area courts, this, like the Springfield District Court, the Westfield District Court. And what they do is they are there. If any woman comes to the court to obtain a restraining order 
or an anti-harassment order. They're there to help the woman fill out the paperwork and go into court with the woman when the woman appears before the judge it, to answer the questions on the affidavit in support of the restraining order. And then what they do is they make sure that the woman knows all the other services that the YWCA offers for women and for children. Again, it's that wraparound uh, services that we offer. So the Safe Plan Advocate will um, form a relationship with that woman because the woman will have to come back to court to get a permanent restraining order and then sometimes the judge will say you have to come back in three months or six months. So, so there's some consistency there so that when the woman goes to court, uh, she feels safe and she feels supported. There are a couple of programs that address sexual assault, the medical advocacy and sexual assault counseling. Explain what each of these programs offer, if you can. Sure. Every single time um, a woman is raped, in Western Mass and goes to a hospital in Western Mass, the YWCA hotline receives a call. We have a team of advocates who respond to those hospitals within an hour. And they stay with the woman while the woman has the physical exam, um, the, where the physical evidence is being taken from her body. So, uh, so sometimes the police officers will bring the woman to the hospital. Sometimes the woman will go on her own or sometimes friends will, will, will bring the woman. But usually the woman doesn't want those people in the room while the physical exam is taking place. So again, we have trained advocates to be present to support this person who's going through one of the most horrific days of their life. And then the team of advocates bring um, duffel bags filled with clothes of all different sizes. So because the woman's clothes are being taken as evidence for the criminal case, we give them underwear, socks, um, flip-flops, sneakers, t-shirts, sweatshirts, um, leggings, whatever. And then we give them, again, all a plethora of service options so that they can feel supported as they begin their journey of healing. And just real quickly, if we can maybe touch on how difficult it is to see these kids obviously deal with some kind of sexual assault or abuse, how important is it to have the services here for them as well? It is incredibly important because it is one of the most horrible things that can happen to anybody to be raped. And whether you're a child, whether you're a woman, or whether you're a man, um, you have been violated in the most terrible way possible. And the trauma that you experience lasts a lifetime. So that's why we use the word survivor when we talk about domestic violence or sexual assault or human trafficking because we want to, to have the most positive spin on the most terrible thing that happened, that you're going to survive you, you ha with support, with counseling, with people who have your best interests in mind you have an opportunity to heal. It takes time and it takes courage, but we want to be there to support those people. And thankfully there are programs and resources out there for those people who yes. need it the most. Yes. When we come back, we'll be talking with a local organization that focuses on helping girls develop and achieve their full potential. You're watching 22 News in Focus. You're watching 22 News and Focus. For over 40 years, Girls Inc. of the Valley has been helping girls in the region, empowering, educating, and guiding girls and young women, helping them navigate the challenges in their lives and achieve their goals. 
With me now are Jess Colson, Director of Development and Communications at Girls Inc. of the Valley, as well as Julia Robinson, a teen member of Girls Inc. Thank you both for being on the program with us today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having Thank us. For having us. Jess, I want to start with you. Sure. First question goes to you. What is Girls Inc. and how did it come to be in Holyoke? Yeah, so Girls Inc. is a youth services nonprofit. We're working with youth ages 8 to 18 in Chicopee, Springfield, Holyoke, and all throughout the Valley. Um, and we were founded in 1981, so over 40 years of support in the Valley. We were actually founded as the Girls Club of Holyoke. Um, there was a need in the community to have a space that was all girl, pro girl, and it broke off of the Holyoke Boys Club, actually. Three of their board of directors came over and founded the Girls Club. Um, then we became Girls Inc. of Holyoke when we joined our national brand and have some support from the national level. And then in 2019, we changed our name to Girls Inc. of the Valley to really encompass all the folks we serve, not just in Holyoke, but throughout the Valley as well. And Julie, you are a teen member of yes, Girls I Inc. Am. How old are you and how long have you been with the uh, organization? Well, I am 13 years old and I joined just last year. Okay. So I'm kind of new here, but it's really fun. Yeah, talk really to me fun. about what you've been experiencing. Obviously, it's a short time, but what have you been experiencing with Girls Inc.? Well, I have been doing activities and having fun there, and um, they've been teaching us about um, sexuality at Spectrum. They've been teaching us about um, STI, which is sexual education. So I've been learning there as well, too, that I've been learning stuff that I don't even learn at school. So it's really, it's a really fun um, journey. I'm yeah. sure it opens up your eyes to the real yes. world and obviously, like you said, learning something you maybe wouldn't experience in the classroom, yes. which is a great experience. Jess, your motto is inspiring all girls to be strong, smart, and bold. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, I'm asking, actually gonna pass this to Julia. Sure. She's ready for this question. Yeah. <laughs> the mission of Girls Inc. is to, um, girls to be strong, smart and bold, and also for them to uplift themselves and um, have a safe space to be, and be more confident in themselves, of course, and make friends. And you say safe space, what does that mean to you? What is a safe space? For girls to be themselves, um, make new friends, and just have like a nice place for them to have fun and be young, of course. And be themselves, Yeah. right? Very important to uh, do that. How many girls are involved in the program? Yeah, so we actually serve hundreds of youth throughout the Valley. We do that in school, after school, and during summer vacations. And when we think about, you know, what makes Girls Inc. Girls Inc., it's really about the three P's for us. It's people, it's place, it's programs. Uh, so like Julia mentioned, a safe space for youth to be themselves. It's inclusive. We have a beautiful new home on 480 Hamden Street that um, we're starting a final renovation on. So we'll be able to serve more youth there. The people, our amazing staff and volunteers and mentors who are trained to really work with the youth and help them achieve their full potential. And then the programs, right? It's all about what they're learning, whether it be STEM education, whether it be about health and wellness, like Julia mentioned, it's all encompassing in that full Girls Inc. experience. Is this just in Holyoke or is this beyond as well? It is not only in Holyoke, it's a very diverse location. It is in Chicopee, Springfield, and also Holyoke as well. So there's different locations girls come from. So obviously it's not just the city of Holyoke. Anybody can get in on this organization and learn those skills in that safe place, right? Yes. Uh, what ages are these girls in these programs? It's from eight to 17, I believe, or 20, because they also have a young adults program, which they could teach them, which I didn't even know about that, but yes, they do. So that's the ages it ranges from. Learning about something new every day, right? Yeah. No matter how long you've been in the program for, uh, it's a wide range of girls, right, in this program. Do the older girls get a chance to talk to the younger girls and maybe give them some advice and mm -hmm. maybe f even form some friendships? Yes, I actually do myself. I talk to the kids all the time and I teach them stuff and I tell them how to be themselves and how to be a really good person as I am too. And I like hanging out with the little kids. They're so nice. <laughs> and what's so nice about you know our new program center is that we have our littles and our teens in the same space. So they do have that opportunity to work together and collaborate. They were just making lasagna when we left, you know, to come on over here. And so there are opportunities to collaborate where there weren't before uh, in our previous home. Do these programs last year round or are there different parts to each program? 
So they are year round, but we do have a summer program called Eureka, mm -hmm. where we go to um, learn STEM inside Eureka, which we will talk about. And throughout the whole year, you get to go, and there's different like stuff you get to do and different events, I believe, too. So a very important question, how can someone join and is there a cost? Well, if you want to join, you will be put on a wait list at www.girlsofthevalley.com. So um, that's how you can join there and there is no cost, so it's really free. Is there a long wait on that wait list? What is the process like for that? Um, yeah, I'll take this one, Julia, yeah. Uh, so in our after school program, we do have limited spacing at this point. Like I said, we're waiting for that final phase of renovation to be finished up before we can unleash the full space for folks. But um, we are in schools as well. So it's possible that maybe somebody's watching this. They are interested to know if Girls Inc. is in their school. The wait list is different for that program. So um, there's all sorts of opportunities to get involved. And I just wanted to talk about the funding sources real yeah. quick. Where does the money come from to obviously um, have these beneficial programs? Yeah, so our funding is really diversified. We have some state and federal contracts that fund very specific programs. We also receive some grant money um, from some local and statewide foundations. Corporate sponsorship is really big for us. We just had a major event, Spirit of Girls, where we had 14 amazing businesses in the Valley support us. And then our individual donors are tried and true. They've been with us since 1981, really, many of them. A long time. That's right. They're, they're dedicated. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, when we come back, we'll be talking about the programs offered at Girls Inc. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Back now with 22 News in Focus and Jess Colson, Director of Development and Communications at Girls Inc. of the Valley and team member Julia Robinson, who is doing a fantastic job, I may add. So Girls Inc., you offer multiple programs for in school, after school, and during the summer. Jess, let's start with the elementary aged programs if we can. What grades or age group is this geared to? Yeah, so our elementary school program is geared toward third through fifth graders. And is there a reason why it's in that specific grade range? Sometimes it's about the funding, you know, um, if a, a funding source is requiring a certain um, grouping to be served, it, it kind of fits there. And um, we had previously had a, a licensed child care um, component to our organization, but since the pandemic, some things have shifted structurally for us as well. What subjects or opportunities are offered in this program? Oh, there's all sorts of fun opportunities. They do a lot of homework help and after school kind of enrichment. Uh, we have great peer tutors who come in. Um, if folks are, are struggling with a particular subject area, there's that academic assistance component. But there's also a lot of fun stuff too, right? We, we kind of like to instill STEM as early as we can, but in a way that's fun and kind of hands-on. So the elementary school group is working on something called Slay Skills right now, which is pretty much like a life school curriculum. Um, and they are working on getting stains out, but using kind of the stem behind stain removal to make that a real life connection. Which is a great pro tip. Yes. Because stains are very annoying. So it's good to know how to do that. Julie, I want to turn to you now. Financial literacy. Why mm. is it important to get girls to learn about money at such a young age like yours? Financial literacy is a way for girls to learn, especially at a young age, how to budget, compensation, and if they want to start a business and to help them with their career in the future, of course, because I, I think about my future all the time. I write down goals and stuff like that. So it's really good that they learn that at a ripe age, of course. What are some of your goals? Some of my goals? Well, putting on the spot. Um, being a lawyer, definitely. Okay. I definitely want to be that or a model, some of those sorts. So I like, I like learning a lot of new stuff. I want to see if I can, I can be anything. I know that definitely. I can be anything in life. And do you think Girls Inc., this organization, is helping you try to reach that goal of yours? Yes, it is, because also I had an event at the Basketball Hall of Fame. There's uh, 400 people that I set a speech with, and it helped me with public speaking and opportunities like this, of course. So right. it's really improved on me. Jess, the country is facing an obesity epidemic, and many people don't understand what a healthy diet should look like, what it should be. What does the food justice program include? Yeah, so our food justice program is all about thinking about our own personal relationship with food. 
Um, and the students who are in that are doing hands-on cooking activities where they're kind of building on those fine motor skills. They're learning about safe kitchen practices, you know, all those knife skills we see on Top Chef or whatever, of course, using safe knives for their age group. Um, but also, it's about getting out of your comfort zone, right? Commitment to trying new foods, new flavors, things maybe they hadn't considered tasting before. And even if you don't like it, there's value in the trying. Um, they also are able to take some field trips to some local farms, uh, to some farmers markets. We've had some ce celebrity chefs in to kind of work with the youth as well and have that new experience for them. Yeah, getting out of that comfort zone is huge, especially for you, Julia. This is obviously, I'm sure, hugely getting out of your comfort zone, right? Yes, it is, but I have watched 22 News before and I can believe I'm actually on 22 News. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Uh, what types of outdoor adventures and physical exercise are offered? You also offer science and technology as well. Um, if you can touch upon that. Well, we also have our own backyard as if at the other um, location that we were at, they didn't have a backyard, but now they do and have a free space for us to play at. And we do hopscotch, jump rope, play bubbles outside, and the kids really enjoy it. And I see the kids playing soccer. And we just have a lot of fun outside too. And it's good that they have their own space and they improved on getting that space for us. And when you are outside, is there a certain age range or is it anyone, any age Anybody. that can come and play? Especially the um, adults are out there. Okay. We were recently out there to watch the solar eclipse. Oh, yeah. So it was really yeah. fun. What kind of reactions did you get from the eclipse? It was really cool. I've never seen it before. Yep. So it was really cool. Uh, you also, as I mentioned, offer science and technology, engineering, math, and as we mentioned a couple times now, STEM programs. Uh, Julia, why focus on STEM? Um, STEM also, girls ranges from seventh to eighth. They think that math and science are just for boys, but really, you guys could do anything and learn it, and it'll really like improve on us too. I like science as well, I really do. And it was just like, make girls think that you a boy doesn't or you don't have to do that because a boy and a girl doesn't matter what like you do you could do that you mentioned you like science what kind of things do you like about the subject well i do like i'm about to dissect frogs so i like doing stuff like that hands-on stuff especially and i like learning especially i'm a like a learning type person yeah it takes a lot to dissect a frog I know. so good for you, you get a strong strong stomach Oh. <laughs> uh, Jess, you have programs for middle and high school aged girls. What are the four uh, cornerstones used to create programming for this age group? Yeah, so coming right off of food justice, right, it's kind of our recipe for how we do our programming. Uh, that first cornerstone, first pillar is around academic support, making sure, again, kids coming in to do their homework, they have what they need to get it done in time so that they can go home, be with their families. Um, personal development, how we interact with one another, how we set boundaries with our friends and in relationships, that's something we really truly focus on. Um, career exploration, like Jalee has been mentioning, she's thinking about a lot of different careers and mm -hmm. she can certainly do any of them. Um, but the opportunity to meet people who are in jobs maybe you didn't consider before is something we love to bring into Girls Inc. And lastly, physical well-being. Julia's has mentioned the backyard. Having that green space in a city setting is so huge. And we're very fortunate to have a park nearby as well. So getting outdoors, being together, playing soccer, maybe some volleyball in the future is really important to us. And summer's right around the corner. So warmer so weather exciting. is finally in our future. <laughs> Inclusion is also part of the mission. What is the Spectrum program? Well, the Spectrum program is a supporting LGBTQ um, program for people who are a part of it or allies for them to express themselves and be themselves there no matter what sexuality you are you can go and it really helps I attend Spectrum a lot and especially for people that I know that are a part of the LG LGBTQ it really helps to know that they accept you and stuff like that because not everybody accepts people like that. And lastly what is involved with community advocacy? Community advocacy is like where we try to protest for our community our itself. Like we did um, Project Red where we passed out period kits for people who do not have it because a lot of people do not have access to that stuff and it's really sad and it should be free to them. So we try to help out with that in our community. All right, great information there. We'll continue our conversation after this break. You're watching 22 News in Focus.
We continue our conversation about Girls Inc. of the Valley and the programs offered for girls and teens in our region. We are back now with Jess and Julia. Jess, I want to start with you on this segment. What is the Eureka program and what is the goal? Yeah, so our Eureka program is a five-year intensive STEM and college and career readiness program. Um, we partner with UMass Amherst. They've actually been our partner for over 10 years now. We just celebrated a big milestone with them. And the approach is really to, as Julia mentioned, get kids interested in STEM and in STEM careers early, but also prepare them for their future, whether it's college, career, the trades, really offering those opportunities to have a whole student approach um, so that students are, are ready to take on the next challenge. And how do you do that? What is in that curriculum? Yeah, so like I mentioned, it's a five-year program. And so the first two years are spent on campus during the summertime at UMass Amherst. And students are in their lab coats. They're in labs with professors and with grad students. And they're doing, you know, maybe some frog dissection, like <laughs> Julia mentioned. And um, they're really getting in there and learning those skills that perhaps they wouldn't have had until they got to college. So they're, they're kind of outpacing their peers in that regard. Um, so they're doing that the first two years. On the third year of Eureka, they're focused on a community action project. So Julia talked about advocacy. We're thinking about what's a struggle or a challenge in our community and how can we bring awareness to it or perhaps even provide solutions to solve it. Um, so last year's uh, cohort three was really working on homelessness in the Valley and kind of raising awareness and providing resources to the homeless community. Year four is all about externships. So we're actually placing student externs in communities throughout the valley. Um, a lot of great organizations in Holyoke, like the Children's Museum and Holyoke Codes have hosted our externs before. And the big thing about this, Nick, is it's a paid opportunity. So a lot of times students are having to choose between coming to Girls Inc. or working a summer job to provide for themselves and their families. And this extern opportunity gives them real live um, opportunities in a career that they're interested in. So year five, we're gearing up for graduation. It means it's time to think about the future. So our students in year five are really working on college applications. They're working on scholarship applications. They have mentors assigned to them to really make sure they're following through on all those deadlines. They have the support they need to read all that information. I'm sure you remember applying to college. It's a really hefty lift and it takes a community to get it done. And those hands-on experiences, especially early on, are very essential. Mm -hmm. How many participants are accepted each year and how do they apply? Yes, yeah, so we have 35 spots in each year of Eureka with the idea of you join us as an eighth grader and you actually stay with us until year five. So right now we're recruiting for rising seventh and eighth graders to join our Eureka program. We have our application live on www.girlsincvalley.org. And that program is free as well. Like Julia mentioned, all our programs are free, but it's the one that has an application and an interview process. So there are some additional steps there to get accepted to Eureka. You also offer programming at some local schools. Which schools is or does Girls Inc. partner with? Yes, yeah, so we're in many schools um, from middle elementary and high school. So if you're in the Chicopee area, we're in Bellamy Middle School, DuPont Middle School, Chicopee High and Stefanik Elementary. In the Holyoke area, we're in Holyoke STEM Academy and Sullivan Elementary. And then in Springfield, we're at Duggan Academy, Kennedy Middle School, Kylie Middle School and Rebecca Johnson Elementary School. So per perhaps somebody watching this is wondering about how to get Girls Inc. at my school. And we love to entertain those conversations and really learn about the needs of that community. Yeah, it's a good number of schools there, especially here locally. Are you looking to expand at all? Or are you good with where you are right now? I think we're always looking to serve more youth. You know, right before the pandemic, we were on track to serve a thousand youth. And then of course, we all know what happened. And so we've been working incrementally to get back up to that range. And we know that when we're meeting students where they're at, i.e. in their schools, the barrier of transportation is removed. So it's hard for students to get to our center for after school programs, but if we're able to meet them where they're at, they're able to have the Girls Inc. experience. In 2016, Girls Inc. National created the Girls Inc. Strong, Smart and Bold Outcome Survey to evaluate which programs get results and to find ways to improve those outcomes. Jess, what did that survey find? So that survey 
essentially was trying to decide, does Girls Inc. work? And where's the data that shows that Girls Inc. works? And so from this outcome survey, we learned that Girls Inc. are outpacing their peers in a lot of different areas, including scores in advanced placement math and science classes. They're less likely to be absent from school than their peers, and they're less likely to be disciplined at school than their peers. Many other data points, very interesting study, uh, but those are some of the highlights for sure. Yeah, Julia, how does your personal experience reflect that survey? Well, as I said earlier, you know, public speaking, it has helped me with that because before I did not, I wasn't a pro at public speaking. I didn't like doing it that much, but now I do. And I really love doing stuff like this. Speaking in front of people, it just really helps build my confidence as a person. Yeah, public speaking, and you have three cameras currently on you right now. Yes, it's a lot taken, but it's really fun to me. Yeah, it's a great experience. Um, and also, I want to talk about the, the volunteers and interns. What role do they play? So usually volunteers, they help us in like the kitchen with cooking. We have a volunteer who helps us with cooking all the time, um, helping us pick up snacks, helping us clean up and stuff like that when we do messy activities. You know, it just really helps there, and I think we can use a lot of people. You've only been in the program for, you said, less than a year now? About yeah. a year? Yeah, about Thir a year. 13 years old, obviously, I'm sure you've experienced a lot in your time so far. Anything you're looking to do in the future, anything you want to accomplish while you are in this program, in this organization? Well, I do want to accomplish learning more about college because I do want to go to college and I do want to succeed in college. So I definitely want to learn more about that. And I am going to get into the Eureka program. So I'm starting to get into that. Jess, how cool is it to see somebody like Julia, you know, mm -hmm. have a, a, a game plan. They know what they want to do. They are striving to get to these goals. How cool is it to see this? It's incredible. I mean, Julia is so driven. You know, when I met her and started to work with her closely a month ago, prepping her for her speaking role at Spirit of Girls, she was shy. I, you can't tell now, she was reserved. But every time we practiced together, we had our dress rehearsal, she grew more and more confident. And she's asking for opportunities just like this, this one here. Um, so the sky's the limit for Julia. And she can be whatever she wants to be. Yes, I can. and you're showing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, when we come back, we'll have our final thoughts. You're watching 22 News in Focus. You've been watching 22 News in Focus. Today, we talked with two local organizations that provide educational and other services to girls and women. I want to thank our guests for being on the program, including members of Girls, Inc. How can people, real quick, find out more information? Yeah, folks can find us online at www.girlsincvalley.org or on social media at Girls Inc. of the Valley. We're always looking for new members, new volunteers, so come find us. All right, awesome. Thank you guys again for being on the program, and thank you for watching our program today. If you missed any of it, you can find it all on our website at wwlp.com. From all of us here at 22 News, enjoy your Sunday. <laughs>